you know, it's vital that you and I take control of our lives, take charge of our lives, and feel like we're in control of our lives. And when we read the Bible, we can see one of the great gifts from God to mankind is free will. That God has given us the free will choice, the free will decisions to, to decide our own destiny, to decide our own future, to take control of our own life. And, and this is really something that God presents all the way from Genesis to the book of Revelation. I'd like to read a verse out of Deuteronomy. This is Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. And here's God and the, the Israelites have been sinning. And they're a little defeated about it. They're, they're, you know, probably what it's like to try to do better, try to do better, try to do better, but somehow or other keep coming up a little short. And so they're a little defeated about it. And here's what God says in response to that. He says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. And then God says, therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. So here's the God of creation looking down at Israel and saying, choose life. And you know, when I think about God I, and I think of this wonderful, loving, heavenly Father, it makes so much sense to me that God would ask us to choose life, that he would say, don't let your life get out of control. I've given you free will. Take charge of your life Make your decisions and choose life. Look at what God says in Ezekiel. Now here's e Ezekiel and <laughs> this is hundreds and hundreds of years after the book of Exodus. And yet what's Israel doing? They're being people. They're back failing. They're back in sin. And so what, what is, is God doing? Now, I've seen a lot of medieval paintings, and that's one of the things I love looking at is some of the seeing kind of the history of the development of Christian thought through art. And there's so many medieval pictures and paintings where God is portrayed. He's got this, this stern, horrible face, and, and he, he's scaring people almost. He's, it's like he's angry about mankind's sin. He can't wait to get back at man for sinning. <laughs> That's just simply not God. God loves us, and he wants us to do what he said in Deuteronomy, choose life. And here in Ezekiel, Israel again, sinning, and, and here's what God says. He says to Ezekiel, say to them, because Ezekiel's the prophet, so God's speaking to Ezekiel, who's going to speak to the people? Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? Do you get the heart of God in this? Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why will you die? What a great message for us today, huh? That, that we could take control of our lives. I, I, I see freedom of will all over this. I don't see God running our life or controlling our life. I see God asking us to make the decisions. And, and a lot of times that just means literally almost getting out of calendar, sitting back, letting your head clear a little bit, turning off the TV, pulling out the iPod buds, you know, just letting your head clear, saying, how can I serve God? What can I do to serve God? How can I serve God? And that's really what we should be doing. And then we have to remember that every once in a while there's a verse that just kind of sticks out like a sore thumb and you're like, huh? Because in, in the context of this huge Bible, which where God is just begging people to take control of their life and, and do a good job, every once in a while there's a verse that just sticks out where it's like God's doing this for us. And we have to know that, that, that in large part, many, many, many of the translations are, are dominated, the translating committees are dominated by people who do not believe in free will. And that's reflected in their translations. And I'd like to look at a difficult translation in Acts chapter 13. 
Now, what's the situation in Acts chapter 13? The situation is Paul, by the freedom of his will, is out trying to spread the gospel. He's out talking to unbelievers about the Word of God. He's going from city to city to city. He's trying to reach the unsaved and see if he can get people to believe. And he definitely, I mean, if you read the book of Acts and the epistles of Paul, he definitely believes if, if you accept Christ, that's your decision. If you reject Christ, that's your decision. So he gets to a city called Antioch of Pisidia. Now, there's two Antiochs in the Bible. There's Antioch of Syria, and there's Antioch of Pisidia. In Acts chapter 13, he arrives at Antioch of Pisidia. Being a Jew, he's welcomed into the synagogue. He's asked, in fact, to speak. Paul, do you have any words of encouragement for the people? Sure, he starts to speak in the synagogue. And he gives such a rousing presentation of the Messiah that, the, the, that everybody goes out and invites their friends. And in verse 44 of Acts chapter 13, we read, The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Man, that was some seriously powerful teaching. <laughs> what happened, though? The, he, Paul was teaching, and Messiah had already come, and he was Jesus Christ. And, and when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly. And, and now, and what they said is very important. I want you to listen to this because he's speaking to the Jews who have not believed his message and have rejected Jesus Christ. And he says, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken first to you since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we're turning to the Gentiles. Look at the freedom of will in that. That these people had rejected Christ and the Apostle Paul looked at him and said, what's going on here is you have judged yourself unworthy of everlasting life. Okay, what about then the, the, the other people who are coming to believe? So verse 48, it says, and this is, that was, that was verse 46. So a couple verses later, verse 48, uh, and when the Gentiles, you know, the people that you would think probably shouldn't believe, the Jews, you would think they should have believed in the Messiah, but they rejected the Messiah. So verse 48, now here are the Gentiles. When they heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the... Oh, I ought to pick up the context because they weren't rejoicing that the Jews rejected the word. Paul said, he quoted this verse, I've made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. In other words, Paul's continuing to teach about the Messiah and how he would bless the Gentiles. And it says, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. Sure, they were like, wow, God didn't send the Jewish Messiah just to the Jews. God sent the Jewish Messiah to the whole world. Amen. Look at John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So they're all excited. These Gentiles, says, they're all excited. And then we read this funny phrase. It says, as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And that sticks out like a sore thumb. All through the Bible, people make their own choice whether to believe or not. And the Jews made the choice to thrust the Word of God away and judge themselves unworthy of everlasting life. But when it comes to believing, here's this verse that says, as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. What, what does that even mean? How, how does that even fit in? Well, some people teach that, well, you see, God's up in heaven, and he's looking down on man, and he says, I appoint you and you and you and you to believe, and then those people do, and nobody else does. But then that makes God's offer to turn from evil and choose life a disingenuous offer, because people can't even do it. God says, choose life. Ha ha, you can't. That makes no sense, and it's not loving. No, you know, there's another way to translate this verse. Because the word, as many as were appointed, yes, the verb can be a passive, but it can also be a middle voice. And that's, that's grammar, but it's important. Because it means that the verse can read this way. That they glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as appointed themselves to eternal life believed. And that's exactly the truth. You see, the Jews judged themselves unworthy. 
And the Gentiles appointed themselves to eternal life. They said, me, me, I want in. And I hope that's you. If you're not born again, I hope you'd like to live forever. We can live forever with God and Christ in paradise. And, and it's not that God does it for us. It's that we appoint ourselves to it. We say, I want it. And we believe in Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 9, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Let's appoint ourselves to everlasting life. God bless you.